In this verse 22 of John chapter 16, we have words which are spoken in the context of a scene wherein Christ seeks to inform his disciples of what to expect from the world. Uh, they are about to be sent forth into the world to do the work that he is sending them to do. He is coming very soon now to his death upon the cross. Uh, the chapter following this one is uh, what is always known as the high priestly prayer of Christ as he goes and, uh, into the garden alone and speaks and prays to the Father uh, on behalf of his people. After that, he will go then to the cross. Such is the nature, then, of the situation for the disciples as they are about to be sent forth alone, seemingly, to do the work that he has given them. And so the Lord Jesus intends for them to understand what it is that they are going to experience. Such is the nature of the world in its relationship with the people of God. But the passage, uh, and this goes back a few uh, chapters, just before uh, chapter 14, where Judas departs and uh, then he begins to speak to his disciples in earnest, uh, the tone of the passage from that point uh, takes on what we might consider to be a negative tone. But the purpose of the Lord here is to prepare them for what was to come. He would not have them under any illusion. In verse 1 of this chapter he says, These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. Now the word for offended is the word scandalizo, which means to entrap, to cause to sin, to cause to stumble. He would not have them to be entrapped. He would not have them uh, to be caused to stumble. And so he speaks these words. His purpose here then is the preservation of his own. The other reason seen in verse 4 of this chapter is that he was now going to be leaving them. And while he was with them, they did not need to know because he was physically with them. But now that he is going to be leaving them, they needed to know. So the Lord Jesus knows that the things that he is telling them throughout these uh, chapters is giving rise to sorrow and fear in their hearts. We see in verse 6, But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. He tells them that it is good for them, however, in verse 7 that he is leaving them. It is expedient for you that I go away. Now with that context in our minds, I want to consider verse 22 uh, very quickly and then close with some thoughts and points of application that we can make use of as we consider our subject this afternoon, which is our eternal hope. The first thing that we consider here from these verses, verse 22 specifically, but some of the surrounding verses also, is a lamentable prediction. As I've said, the passage is full of the words of Christ concerning and regarding the struggles and difficulties, the sufferings that the disciples will face. The words stretch back, as I say, all the way to chapter 13. After Judas has left them, he goes to carry out his act of betrayal. The Lord Jesus Christ says, says to him, go, that thou doest, go and do quickly. He wants him out of the room. And as soon as Judas, the son of perdition is gone, then he begins to speak to his disciples. The hate of the world that he tells them of, the suffering which the disciples have to endure, his own departure from them, the tribulation that they will meet with. And here in verse 22 uh, of chapter 16, the Lord seems to encapsulate all of this with the word sorrow. And ye now therefore have sorrow. In the verses preceding, in verse 21, he compares that sorrow to that of a woman who is in labor, bringing a child into the world, and the sorrow that accompanies that. So it's an intense sorrow. It is a sharp sorrow. It is an unavoidable sorrow. Here's a summary then of the Lord's lamentable prediction here. He says in verse 20, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, to you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. This is no lie. This is the truth. Verily.
And truly or surely, surely I say unto you, surely ye shall weep and lament. They will indeed weep, they will indeed lament. Verse 22, ye now therefore have sorrow. Because of all of these things, you will have sorrow now. But the Lord's words, though, do not end there. He continues on. In verse 20, he continues to say, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. And in verse 22, we see the reason why that is, as we see also a remarkable promise, as well as a lamentable prediction. A remarkable promise. In verse 22, the Lord says, but I will see you again. Six words, but what a remarkable promise these words are for the disciples. Their separation physically from the Saviour was not forever. That was the source of their sorrow, really. That's what it came down to. The fact that the Lord Jesus Christ had said, and we read those words specifically, a little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me. And it was that first part that they focused on. A little while and you will not see me. That was what gave rise in their hearts to sorrow. For now, the Lord Jesus says in verse 22, for now you will have sorrow, but I will see you again. What a promise that was for them. Perhaps they had assumed that once the Lord had departed from them, they would see him no more, the same, in, in the same way as they would see others who had died no more. They perhaps had accurately interpreted some of the darker words of the Lord Jesus Christ in relation to his death, that he was going to die. And when our friends die, we do not see them again. They're gone. But throughout, the Lord Jesus assures them, and again here, that though they would not see him for a little while, yet they would see him again a little while after that. And what sorrow and fear had stricken into their hearts at the thought of Christ departing from them. He was the one who had provided for them. He was the center of their lives. He was the one who protected them and led them. Their lives revolved around him. And yet he was saying now that he was going to depart from them, that they would be without him. And to be without him in this life was a horror to them. It gave rise to this sorrow that the Lord knew was in their hearts. Because I said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. But this promise, I will see you again, brought comfort. No doubt brought comfort throughout their lives and in all their troubles. Many of these men were martyred and put to death. Some tortured, imprisoned, abandoned by all men, suffered many things. But they had this one promise, and such a promise it is from the Lord Jesus but I will see you again. How remarkable, how precious a promise this is to them. But let me see, lastly, an immutable prize. What is this prize? It is the reversal of their feeling of sorrow and the replacement of it with joy. What a prize that is. They are discouraged, they are disheartened and downhearted. Yet all of that sorrow, the Lord Jesus Christ says, will be turned into joy in verse 20. In verse 22, he says, Ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice. Your heart shall rejoice. But not only that, but that joy, no man take it from you. This is why I say this is an immutable prize. It cannot undergo... change this prize it cannot be taken from them their joy for now had been taken from them they would have sorrow the Lord Jesus Christ was departing from them and they would know affliction and difficulty trouble and that happiness that comes from their circumstances was going to depart because their circumstances were going to change their feelings of elation of happiness at being with Christ are going to be turned into sorrow at his departure. Men will hate them, the Lord Jesus Christ tells them. Men will hate them. They will persecute them. They will drive them out of the synagogues so that they could not worship, so they could not meet together. They would drive them out of the cities and take them captive in prisons and far worse. But 
when they would see Christ again, then their joy would be full. A heart shut rejoice, and that joy shall never be taken away from them. What a glorious consolation that is for them then. What a great hope the Lord gives them here. It is unrivaled as a prize. It is not a fleeting prize. It is an everlasting, unchanging prize. A prize that cannot be taken from them. Your joy no man taketh from you. Here is a great hope for the disciples then. In this, in the strength and truth of this promise. They would go forth to spend and to be spent in the name of Christ. And for the word of his testimony. What a simple verse this is. What profound and encouraging truth it communicates. Your heart shall rejoice. I will see you again. Your heart shall rejoice. And your joy no man taketh from you. May the Lord help us to consider it carefully. But as we close then, there are a number of things that we can draw out for our use and for our encouragement. These words are set here as words that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to his disciples in certain definite circumstances. But despite that, they are set here for our benefit and can be applied to our lives and can be taken and used in our, in our own lives. So the first thing to draw out here in relation to ourselves is a stark fact. And that truth and fact is this, that we will have sorrow in this life. Perhaps you're surprised to hear that. It should not surprise us to endure sorrow and suffering in this life. The Lord here establishes for his disciples and us by extension that we will have sorrow. The Lord Jesus Christ states it plainly, and ye now therefore have sorrow. There's nothing wrong with that. The Lord Jesus Christ states it. It is a fact. At the end of the chapter, he says, In the world ye shall have tribulation. It is expected. And don't we know it? Of course we do. And perhaps especially over the last year, we have known it. In so many months, being isolating, separating from our brothers and sisters in the faith, from our families even, from the Church of Christ. And many have perhaps suffered anxiety and Depression, discouragement from a lack of social contact, a spiritual deprivation and not being able to meet and come together to worship the Lord as the Lord has commanded in his word. Forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. Of course, this is not the only sorrow we've experienced. There have been sorrows in the past. There will be sorrows in the future. There will be difficulties, sicknesses, times of uh, downheartedness in our lives, times of struggle and of obstacle. There is no avoiding sorrow in this life. In our youth, we perhaps unwittingly consider life that it will always be as it is. We do not know or sense what is to come. As we grow older, we come to know it well. This is true of all men and women. We, however, who know Christ have a deeper sorrow even than that. For what is common to all we are sorrowful of our own condition. We are sorrowful of our own sin. We are sorrowful, I hope, over our constant uh, succumbing to temptation and being beset by sin. Our failings. Of sinning against the Lord in thought and word and deed. We are sorrowful over the sin that we see surrounding us. Mankind at wars with itself delves further and further into depravity. Corrupting the truth. We will have sorrow in this life. Don't be shocked. Don't be dazed at this. It's plainly here in the scriptures. Let's not be foolish. Let's not feel sorry for ourselves either because of what we have to endure. It was ever thus for all of Christ's church throughout history and will be until history is brought to an end. Life does include sorrow. But secondly, we should observe something specific about the promise of Christ here. And that is this, that the promise is to those who have known Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ here, in bringing 
the consolation for the suffering, so to speak, says, but I will see you again. And the word there I want you to notice is again. It is this previous knowledge of him which promotes the heart rejoicing. For only those who know Christ have experienced his presence and grace know that un what an unrivaled prize it is to possess. I will see you again. You have seen me now. You will not see me for a while, but then you will see me again. It is true that all men everywhere will see Christ again, for he will come to judge. As Isaiah 66 and verse 5 seems to suggest, and it seems very apt for the specific situation the disciples are in. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. This text applies very well and aptly to the disciples in this passage. They were going to be cast out, they were going to be killed, they were going to be those of whom that many would say they did the Lord's service in persecuting them. Verse 2 of this very chapter says, Yet when Christ comes again, it will be for the joy of the people of God, those who have known him, those who have seen him, will see him again. And the question arises naturally then this afternoon, do you know Christ? Have you met with him, as it were, for the first time? Every eye shall see him, every knee shall bow, but will your heart be filled with joy for having seen him whom you love, or with fear and with dread for having seen him return in judgment? Do you not know him? We must consider ourselves and our souls this afternoon then to that end. We may also observe here uh, another truth which is seen in the text, the, the words of Christ here, that no matter how deep the sorrow of this life might be, the joy of Christ's presence outweighs it. Now this truth seems to elude us all too often in our lives. We are so taken up with this present sensation, with our present experience, we are taken up with also what we have to worry about in the future of tomorrow. That which we see, that which we feel, that which we touch, the emotions that we experience of fear and of anxiety. All of these things are what we obsess over and think of and analyze and never think of the joy that is to come. And Paul says in Romans, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, which he acknowledges, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Such is the joy of us seeing Christ, that the sorrow that we shall feel, that we feel now, shall forever and eternally be overturned, be turned into rejoicing, as the Lord Jesus says in verse 20 of this chapter. The intensity of such a joy cannot be measured. The joys that we feel on earth are mere tasters and shadows of what there is to come. We have moments in this life of pure joy, but those moments are limited and few. And we can all think of such times of perhaps utter contentment and happiness. But the problem with happiness is that it always depends on what is happening we all think of such times as those. But the joy of Christ's presence will be so great as to utterly banish any feeling of sorrow. It will outweigh that sorrow by such magnitude that it will be dismissed and eliminated completely. Consider this afternoon and appreciate, Christian, what is to come for you if you're Christ. Do you feel perhaps abandoned of late? downcast with life and what you face as the Lord as it seemed to you departed from you maybe you find it difficult to pray feel cut off from Christ's presence there are times like that in the Christian life 
we learn from the Song of Solomon that this may happen. The bride arises from her sleep and finds her beloved is departed, goes out into the streets, looking for him. Have, hast thou seen him whom my soul loveth? The Lord withdraws his presence. But here the Lord Jesus Christ says, I will see you again. Grasp that promise. Hold it tightly and seek him that he may be found of you if you seek him with all of your heart. That anxiety, that fear, that sorrow, that discouragement or that dread that is in your heart is not worthy to be compared. It is laughable to compare it to the joy that is to come for us. If we could just truly grasp in all of its breadth and length and depth, we could not help but laugh. If we were ever so taken up with this short sorrow, knowing what joy there was to come, that Christ's presence infinitely outweighs all sorrow, for in his presence is fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And yet we are so taken up with the suffering of this life. There should be joy in our hearts. He is peerless in his worth and unrivaled in his excellence. But then consider also this from these words, that man is powerless to take the joy of Christ's presence from us. Man is powerless to take the joy of Christ's presence from us. Though he may have power over everything else, man cannot take our joy in Christ. It cannot be done. Man might be able to strike fear in your heart so you're afraid to go out of your front door. Man may be able to tell you to stay at home and not come to church. Man may be able to do all of these things. But he cannot take the joy of a Christian. If we truly grasp this, then we already have a foretaste of what it is to come already. Because when we shall be with the Lord and we shall see him like he is and we shall be like him, then the joy of the Lord shall never be taken from us, nor shall any man even attempt to do so. But what we need to realize is that that is already the case. Man cannot take our joy from us because it is in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are a series of absolute statements in this verse. Christ says, I will see you again. There is no maybe there, it is certain. He says further, and your heart shall rejoice. We will rejoice with joy in our hearts. That is also certain. There are many who will not rejoice, for they will be in terror for their souls. But for his people, it is certain, your heart shall rejoice. Then there is this, your joy, no man taketh from you. And again, there is no maybe there. It is certain, man is powerless to take the joy of Christ's presence from us. Specifically here, Christ is talking about his physical presence. There are times in our lives when we do lose the joy of our salvation. It must be so because David the psalmist prays, Return unto me the joy of my salvation. But when we shall see him and be like him, seeing him as he is in his glorious majesty, then our joy cannot be taken from us by any man. In our lives, and perhaps we've seen this most emphatically, as we've said already this year, man has power over us. They wield the power that is given to them by God, and very often they do so unjustly and unrighteously. Men have power over us, and with their actions they can cause us great sorrow, as they did for the disciples. This was one of Christ's points in speaking to them of what men were going to do to them. How they would hate them, how they would cast them out of the synagogues, how they would even kill them and think it God's service. But here Christ, with great emphasis, states that when he will see us again, no man shall take away our joy. Ultimately, men are powerless. May they lord it over the people. May they make unjust laws. May they try to suppress God's work and legitimize sin. Ultimately, they have no power. The powers that be are ordained of God. And as Christ said to Pilate, they should have no power at all over us except it were given to them by our Father. Let that encourage you this afternoon. And then finally, as we close, let us consider this. That since it cannot be taken from us, our joy becomes endless 
and immutable. Christ hints here at his final and everlasting presence with his people, for he will dwell with them and we shall be forever with the Lord. What a wonderful truth that is for the weary and sin-sick pilgrim. And sometimes it feels as if there is no escape from the sorrows of this world and that they come one after another like the billows of the sea rolling over our heads as the psalmist himself experienced. But what a wonderful and momentous event it will be when we shall see him. What a truth for the sin-sick Christian. I'm tired of sin, foot sore and weary. The darksome path hath dreary grown, but now a light has risen to cheer me. I see in thee, my star, my sun. What a light shall rise upon us on the day of our Lord's return. Look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now. From the head of the church will come with triumph to take his weary and waiting people home. We shall forever be with the Lord. And forever, what a word of peace. Trouble and sorrow persist against us in this world, but it is not forever, but a little while. And Christ will come when our hearts rejoice. It will be a joy that is endless and immutable. But it cannot be taken from us and will indeed be forever at peace. Without that truth, we would surely despair. We would be of all men most miserable. And when we forget this truth, we plunge ourselves into despair. But let's not forget this. Our joy shall be full, unending, never changing. Revelation 21, verse 3, which we read earlier, there is a verse that's such a note of finality and hope. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And he shall wipe every tear from their eyes. What a triumph it will be to hear those words. Through sorrows and snares we finally be at rest. And the pilgrim church will become entirely and forever the church at rest. Through hidden dangers, toils and death, he gently cleared my way. And through the pleasing snares of vice, more to be feared than they. Through all eternity to thee a joyful song I'll raise. But oh, eternity is too short to utter all thy praise. The Lord himself will see us again. He takes great joy in it. In the chapter which follows this, he speaks to the Lord and says, I would that they be where I am. That is his desire. And so it shall be fulfilled. And our joy shall be full, which no man taketh from us. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts this afternoon for his own name's sake.